So if we were to write a law, so I'm going to kind of go through the motions again here. Uh, a change, whoops. So a change of position always requires a change in time. So change in position, I could call that delta S. Now the reason why I'm going with delta S is that is sort of classical way to describe position. It could, it'll ultimately in vectors work out to delta X, delta Y, delta Z because we have X, Y, and Z directions that something can change in. We even use R for position. Okay, so S and R are sort of classical ways to encode for position. The reason for that is we like to use P for momentum because there's some Latin word that relates to momentum. Uh, I forget why we pick that. I'm gonna go with delta S. You guys use delta P, that's perfectly fine as long as you know what you're talking about in that one. And then I'll stick with a change in time is delta t because that is pretty classical. We use the little t for that. Okay, so a change of position is obviously equivalent to itself. Um, delta s is dependent on delta t. Okay. Which implies that we need to take special care with time and treat it as an independent quantity, which makes it this fancy form of one. If you're independent, you get to wear fancy pants. I guess that's a way to, um, to look at it. And so uh, delta S equals itself. This is our dependent quantity. And I can multiply it by the independent quantity still just a, an identity because it's just multiplied by one this is an almost axiom because it's ready to encode for what the law describes which is something always requires and so if i uh, continue on here then i'll have delta s for delta t times that delta t and so this always requires business has now been encoded for. Change of position always requires a change in time. Okay? Now the axiom has encoded for what the law describes. So what is the ratio of the change in position to change in time? Have you ever looked at a meter, like perhaps on your way to school today? Was there something in your face the whole way to school that was a delta S per delta T? What's that? That gauge in front of your face, behind the steering wheel, speedometer, something in miles per hour, kilometers per hour. It's a change of position per change in time thing. It's measuring the speed uh, of your car. That changes if you press the gas or the accelerator button or pedal. All right. So what we have here Let's, uh, this boils down into delta S is 
So the trick is, you know, what do we name this? And we call this speed or velocity if it has a direction, all right? And so this means a formula could be this right here. Delta S, a change in position, is equivalent to the same but not the same as speed times the change in time. Distance equals rate times time. That formula you did a few word problems on in algebra class. All right. This is our basic uh, motion equation. It's the first motion equation. In fact, what I call it, I call it the first, and this sounds strange, zeroth, that's an R, law. Now why do I call it the first zeroth law? Well, there was this dude named Newton, you might have heard of him, who had the first, second, and third laws of motion. He's kind of famous and important, and I'm kind of not famous <laughs> as important to physics as Newton was. So, but Newton didn't uh, do this work as far as anyone knows. He didn't go to the backstory, but all of his work encompasses it, for sure. And so I said, all right, well, this is the zeroth law. And so the first time I wrote this, uh, or we wrote it in my old grad advisor, we called it the zeroth law until we realized, wait a minute, there's not just one of these. There's another one of these. So we said, okay, this is going to be the first zeroth law. So Newton had one, two, and three. I got to go back to zero since I think it's foundational to his laws. All right? Now, if you were to turn to, say, probably chapter two in most any physics textbook, the very first thing that they'll card out is a position equation, or sometimes what they'll card out is the speed equation, which would just be, uh, you could write V equals delta S per delta T. That's typically where a physics book starts, is with the velocity equation or speed equation. Now they also call that the average speed. So when you go to read about this, if you haven't already, they will call this equation right here average speed. Now I've got a question for you. When you look at that, why would a subtraction divided by another subtraction, how is that anything like computing an average? Isn't averaging adding up some things and dividing by the count of those same things? Yeah. Everybody and their dog knows that that's how you compute an average. So how is it that the ratio of two differences is the same sort of thing as the count, the ratio of some counts, some sums and some countings? That makes no sense, right? Okay, it will make sense next Wednesday when we sort out what an average is and how this really is an average speed, okay? But at face value, I just want to say that, just because if you haven't read it, you will, they call that average speed. And that's weird. It always bugged me when I was an undergrad. It never totally made sense of it until uh, later why that was an average. Okay. It worked out as an average, but it didn't make any sense to me at the time. All right. This thing right here, speed, velocity, that is a construct. Okay? We gave it a name and a symbol. We constructed new knowledge. Because guess what? It's not going to be a constant. I mean, it, it can be. If every change in position is the same amount, relative to 
a change in time that's always a, like every it's a, the change in time is always a second and the change of position is always a meter or it's always two meters well then you are going to have a constant speed so it's possible to have a constant speed but it's not necessary there's nothing about changes in position that require speed be constant but a circle if you remember back to the circumference and diameter no matter what happened, when we divided any circumference by its diameter, we only got one number. So the physical reality of a circle demands a constant. The physical reality of motion does not demand a constant, but it does demand a construct. And so speed could be anything, all right, uh, as provided that there's non-zero time associated with a change in position, all right? So, I had been mentioning construct versus constant, and I wanted to uh, emphasize that before this video. So, measurable quantity number one is change in speed, which we use V for speed. We also use it for velocity uh, when it's a vector, when we know the direction. Change in time, still what it is. And of course, these every thing is identical to itself, uh, so we can always write them as identities. All right. Uh, it is the case that a change in speed is proportional, or it's dependent on a change in time. I can't have one without the other, and so. Uh, that means that I need to um, make a fancy form of one at a time and then uh, I write my dependent identity I put the fancy form of one with it which means I get a delta V per that and so once again we get a new construct and the trick is what do we name that thing what is the time rate of change of speed It's a word that's almost identical to the thing that causes the change in speed in your car. That thing that you put your foot on. The accelerator. So acceleration. Acceleration is the name of this construct. And again, there's nothing about this that's required to be constant because I could have any change in speed associated with any other change in time. So there's nothing about changing speed. If speed wasn't required to be constant, a change in speed isn't required to be constant. All right, It can be constant, like in the case of gravity. Gravity has a constant acceleration associated with it. And so our um, delta V equals a delta t and this is the second zeroth law or what I would call sizzle the first one was fizzle f z l first zeroth law second zeroth law s z l the statement of law is in English. Okay, so this is the axiom. For the second zeroth law, it's another way to state the second zeroth law. And uh, from this, you could write acceleration is delta V per delta T, which is essentially what we've said over here. If you look in a physics textbook, 
they always start with v equals delta s for delta t and a equals delta v for delta t. They don't start with the other form. They list it, but they don't start with it. And they just, they give the definition, but they don't give the backstory. All right? And so it's important that you construct that backstory yourself. Gives you a conceptual foothold that in the long run makes the doing of physics simpler because you are more familiar with the everything that's underneath the hood, so to speak. All right? Back here, change in speed always requires a change in time. And so here's a change in speed, and here's a change in time. There's a this per that. I can sort of see the always requires mathematically in that axiom related to that law. But over here, so somebody tell me, step one says expand the left-hand side of this equation. How do you ex expand a delta anything? So it would be a difference of two instances of that variable. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to have s minus s sub 0, which is essentially the same as an s2 minus s1 or an s4 minus s3 or an S11 minus S5, okay? It's a final value versus an initial value. And the sub-zero is referring to time equals zero. That's how we do that. Now, you, you might see things like... Um, so other things that you might see uh, would be S final minus S initial equals V delta T, where sub F and sub I refer to final and initial. There's multiple ways that they go at it. But if there is no subscript on a letter in physics, we mean that's the final amount for that interval. And a sub zero or a sub any number would indicate at what time index. Okay, so those are just some of the um, linguistic rules of the game. So we have two equations here. One of them is uh, the one we started with. The other one is just a rearrangement of those things. But here's what I want to point out to. Uh, well, ver verse two, number two, uh, isolate the term representing the final value of the variable. Okay, that's easy. S equals S naught plus V delta T. Now I have three useful equations. How would you say that in English without using words like add and multiply and equals? What phrase would go with S? S is the, S is the final position. So the final position is equivalent to position plus, well, what is V delta T? Look up at the top. It's a change in position. Isn't this really basically the sum of the parts equals the whole? So what you end up with finally has to be what you started with plus whatever changed. Technically speaking, you could write any quantity this way. So mass. The final mass is going to be equal to the initial mass plus the change of mass. 
The final force is going to be equal to the initial force plus the change in force. The final speed is going to be equal to the initial speed plus change speed. The final this is going to be equal to the initial this plus the change in this. It wouldn't matter what the quantity is. You could start with final equals initial plus change in that same quantity symbolically. Everything we do in science could be written that way. But the trick is, or the important deal is, yes, I can write a change in something, but if I don't know what the structure of that change is, and I don't have a way to measure it, then I'm stuck. I've said something that's trivially true, uh, but I don't, if I don't know how to build or measure that change, then I don't have anything except a great idea. So it's important to be able to um, construct that change. What are its parameters? So the parameters of a changing position are speed and time. Distance equals rate times time. Right? So I've sort of translated, I've sort of said number three, and so if you want to, you can go back and watch the video uh, and uh, see what happens. Uh, number four. So expand the left-hand side of the second zeroth law axiom. So I think, you know, we're really just difference in letters here. And then we want to do the same thing, isolate it. And of course, that's V naught plus delta V. And once again, this change thing is encoded for by that set of parameters in a product relationship. So this product relationship business, products were really simple and sweet when it was just two times two is four. Okay. If I have two sets of two, there must be four things. If I have three sets of three, there must be nine. Man, it was great when that's all a product involved. But now products involve multiplying things that, well, can you see speed, acceleration, or time? Can you see those things? No. You cannot see speed, acceleration, or time. You can see that something's moving, and you perceive that it has a speed, and you can even perceive that its speed is increasing, but you can't see speed. You can see objects, you can see places, you can see objects going from place to place, and this object went from that place to the other place faster than some other object did. Or you might have see that it started off slow and then it got faster. You don't, speed isn't a substance, it isn't an object. It's a perception, and it's a perception that can be quantified, it can be measured. So if we go back to those questions, what can I see? What can I measure? So I can measure something that I can't see. Because it's built out of things, well, one of the things, position changes, I can see positions. I can see objects at locations. But I can't see the time parameter that's associated with speed and I can't see the speed change or the time change that's associated with acceleration, all right? <clears throat> so again, we, we end up listing <coughs> three equations, actually four equations per um, thing. So there's, there's this equation, this equation, and these two versions of the same thing. So there's really four versions of each law axiom. Guess what? One of those will be more useful in certain problem solving situations than the other. And all they are are rearrangements of one another. Oh, we forgot one. There's a fifth one. I already showed it though. Uh, I can take this thing and go, oh, that's V equals delta S per delta T. But I didn't put it on this thing because we'd already done it on our previous um, watch column. So there's actually 
five versions of each law axiom. Just mathematical rearrangements. Trivial stuff for you at this point in your uh, edumacation. All right. Um, turn in the page. So this first part of getting to the zeroth law theorem was just reviewing the first and second zeroth laws and mapping out their variations, building a formula sheet in one sense of the word. So now we're going to do we're going to build a theorem. This might be the first time you've built a theorem. You might have seen some theorems stated in math class. Uh, especially if you took calculus, but you probably haven't built one before. So we're going to do that today. So here's these two law axioms. And the question that I'm going to ask in here that's not written, is there anything about the motion? These are two ways to describe the motion of an object. I can talk about its position change, or I can talk about its speed change. What do these two descriptions of motion have in common? Time. Isn't the time that it took to change position identical to the time it took to change speed? It's not like they're working on different time scales. If it wasn't moving, and it moved from here to there, then it had to obtain a speed. That was a change in speed from zero to whatever it ended up being at the new position. And the time interval between the speed change and position change was the same time interval. So it is the case, necessarily, that this change in time and that change in time are the same change in time. So it is the case that delta t equals delta t. Well, delta t over here would be delta s per v, and delta t over here would be delta v per a. Okay. So this is a, an axiomatic theorem. And theorems always obtain when you do this sort of maneuver where the common element of two other functions uh, uh, stand in equivalence, and then you bring in what they're equal to. Then you create what's called a theorem. And so a, th a theorem would relate two or more laws. That's what's happening here. All right. Now I tell you, let t equal t and then flatten or get rid of quotients uh, using the pro appropriate arithmetic. So a ds equals v dv. This is the zeroth laws theorem axiom. It's an axiom. It's not the law. It's a version of the law. But what would the law statement be? So think up here. What sort of law statement should or could we make to make sense of this? So how would you combine the two English statements that you must have on paper by now? Every change of position always requires a change of time. Every change of speed always requires a change of time. How would you combine those most simple way? Each change of position requires a change of time. Each what? A change of speed and position requires a change of time. So yeah, it's you know so simple. It, seemingly hard. Every change of position and every change in speed require a change in time. They, they don't, they're never separated 
from one another. Well, could I have a constant speed that results in a change of position? Is a constant speed a change in speed? No. Okay. So here's the thing. When I look at ADS equals VDV, there is nothing about the law statement that makes that map obvious. I would have a hard time writing ADS equals VDV if that were the law statement that I started with. Because I only see I see change in position and I see change in speed in my law statement, but I don't see a change in time, nor do I see acceleration in speed uh, as constant values or average values actually is what they are in this case. So that's the weird thing about a theorem is the English version of of it, I can't really, I can't call it a law. So really when it comes down to it, this is sort of wrong. This thing right here, it's, it's not the law because it's a theorem. And, but the parts of the theorem or where the theorem came from, its laws do come together in that statement. So this is a law-like statement whose axiom is a theorem built out of laws. You know, so the, the pattern here is we kind of broke our pattern. All of our prior law patterns in English had the measurable quantities specifically, and those things showed up in the math. And in this case, we created a new thing and that shook out constructs of speed and acceleration. But then when we bring these together, the thing that they have in common, the, the only thing that's identical in the first and second zero laws, I get this new equation and the law that it would be if I combined it, its law statements doesn't really lead me to that equation. Because I can look at the other two laws you know, uh, change in speed. Okay, that's there. Change of position, that's there. But I don't have a change of time. And that's because change in time has been locked up in those critters. Because the definition of those critters is where the time is hidden Etc. So it's not as obvious. That's why I call it. A, that's why it's it is called a theorem and not a law. It's a theorem about the laws, and it has a law-like statement, but I can't generate it from that law-like statement unless I already know some other things. Right? So, a uh, little subtle. So the zeroth law theorem states that acceleration times a change of position is equivalent to this speed times the change in speed. Technically, that's almost correct. The thing that's missing is that this is an average speed. Now, I told you that V is understood as average speed, even though nothing about delta per delta communicates the idea of an average. You're not summing anything. You're not dividing by a count of anything. Okay, but it is an average. And so, average speed, and we're going we're gonna to build the average speed formula next week. We're going to build it graphically. We're going to use graphs of motion to build this formula. 
which we haven't we haven't done that yet. And then we're going to relate the first and second zeroth laws back to uh, also to graphs. All right. So this formula A D S really equals one half v plus v naught delta v. And of course, this works out. I can get rid of that half by multiplying a 2 on both sides. And I have v plus v naught times v minus v naught. Well, that is a difference of perfect squares. So this right here is the zeroth law theorem axiom. And this right here is your standard textbook version of the ZLT axiom, except the way that that axiom is built. And the way that that axiom is built, if they show it in your book, is it's just a mathematical, it's, math, it's witchcraft, it's just mathematical sorcery. If I take time out of this equation and jam it into that one and shake it all up, then I get this out. All right? But that's not, <laughs> uh, this doesn't make any sense. In fact, I'm, I'm going to, uh, so that we can get out at 11, I'm going to uh, bring that up on screen.